Today is Polycarp. <laughs> Let's start with a prayer. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and kindle them under the fire of thy love. To the forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to talk about St. Polycarp of Smyrna. And it's interesting, I was driving over here, coming on I-285 to the perimeter highway. And to get to St. Francis of Sales, I have to take the Smyrna exit. And I hardly noticed that, but I said, well, this is very appropriate for Polycarp of Smyrna. Uh, Polycarp uh, was Bishop of Smyrna, which is not near Mapleton. It's actually in Asia, it's in Asia Minor, uh, Turkey, a modern-day Turkey. He's not far from Ephesus and some of the other other uh, towns in which St. Paul uh, <coughs> preached uh, the gospel. Um, Polycarp, he has an interesting name. In, in Greek, it means much fruit. So this is like uh, Mr. Fruitful uh, is his name uh, in, in Greek. And he wrote, uh, He wrote. we have some writings. Uh, one, we have one epistle that, that is believed universally to be genuine. It's his, his first epistle to the Philippians, and I've passed that out for you last week, and we'll talk about that. And then there is a, a document called the Martyrdom of Polycarp. It's also called the Letter of the Smyrnians. The, the people from Smyrna wrote a letter to describe the martyrdom of their bishop uh, in 156 uh, AD. Uh, and it is the earliest martyrdom that we have outside of the, the New Testament, the earliest authentic one uh, that is, is believed to have been written by eyewitnesses to the martyrdom. So it's a very interesting historical document for the church, uh, indeed. Um, Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians was written uh, about the same time as Ignatius's letter. And we can tell that because of the contents of the, of the epistle, the epistle of Polycarp, about 110 AD. And he was martyred about 156 AD. And from the martyrdom, uh, you can tell that he's, in a, in, he's a very old man, perhaps in his 80s, uh, when he was martyred. And Polycarp is a great importance to church history uh, and one of the reasons is as I talked to you there's there's not a lot of early documents that come uh, from the ancient world and particularly from the Christian world we have the epistle of, uh, of Clement first Clement that we talked about we have the, the letters of Ignatius and the next document we really have is Polycarp next week we'll talk about the Didache the teaching of 12 apostles it's another early document but once you've talked about those documents, you're pretty much talking about the entire universe of the early documents written after the New Testament. Um, Polycarp is important because he uh, was a disciple of St. John the Evangelist. He was taught by John. Uh, tradition holds that John lived to an old age in, in the town of Ephesus. Uh, and the tradition says that he appointed Polycarp Bishop of Smyrna. And Polycarp learned from John and two weeks from now, we'll talk about St. Irenaeus. He lived from about 130 to 200. And he writes about Polycarp a lot. And writes about Polycarp because Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp. Irenaeus was a young man, and, and he sat at the feet of Polycarp in, in Asia Minor, Turkey. And, and Polycarp told him what he had been taught by the apostles and passed on that teaching to Irenaeus. Uh, and we have some writings of Irenaeus. The reason, one of the reasons we have those writings is because in, when Emperor Constantine won the Battle of the Milvian Bridge in 311 AD, and he issued the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, allowing Christianity to, to be a legal religion in the Roman Empire, and Constantine himself converted to Christianity. They founded the city of Constantinople in 330 AD, called the first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea in 325. So in the early 300s, suddenly the empire became much more Christian and, and favorable to Christianity, and the emperor became Christian. And he gave, as we talked about uh, last time, he gave the Lateran Palace to be the first cathedral church in Rome, 
Uh, he gave other palaces, uh, other basilicas that became the early churches of Rome. But he also, he also uh, worked with bishops. And suddenly the bishops became, uh, uh, I hesitate to say the word friends, but they were colleagues with the emperor. The emperor would, would support the bishops. And there was a man named Eusebius of Caesarea. Uh, he, uh, he was a bishop of Caesarea. And he wrote the first history of the church called the Ecclesiastical History of St. Eusebius. He's not a saint. Uh, and he lived in Caesarea, which is important because one of the great libraries in the ancient world was in Caesarea. And Eusebius had access to all kinds of ancient writings, which we did not have. He had a lot, access to a lot of writings from Irenaeus, many of which had been lost. But Eusebius, in his history of the church, would quote from these documents. So we have long quotations from Irenaeus in Eusebius' history, and the quote, some of the quotations deal with Irenaeus' reflections and, 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 and stories about Polycarp, and therefore these things come down to us and shed a lot of light on Polycarp. We don't have much on Ignatius, and we have even less on Clement of Rome that we talk about, but because of Irenaeus' uh, uh, writings being preserved in history by Eusebius, we can know a lot more about Polycarp than, than otherwise would be the case. And I, I, I want to start off by, by um, reading some of that from Eusebius' ecclesiastical history, because you find there are anecdotes that are, that are sort of very enlightening uh, about Polycarp and about what was going on. This chart here, we're going to be using this when, in two weeks when we deal with St. Irenaeus, but I put it up here because uh, it's useful because when we read about Eusebius, he'll talk about various people uh, and things. And over here we have the bishops of Rome from St. Peter uh, uh, down, and we have Clement that we've talked about, Clement's epistle. And most of these bishops of Rome we know very little about, but we're going to know about a little bit about a man named Anicetus, who was uh, bishop of Rome. Uh, and later, uh, God willing, in the fall, we're going to talk about Pope St. Victor, uh, who was contemporary of Irenaeus, uh, and, 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 and we'll talk about that. But Polycarp had dealings with this man, Anicetus, uh, on this chart. He actually, in time, he's, he, he, he died a year or so into uh, the uh, papacy of, of, of Anicetus, uh, so we'll talk about that. But let me turn to, to Eusebius' History of the Church, which is an interesting document, and I, you know, I commend it to you if you want to read some early church history. Eusebius talks about these early, early fathers and early bishops. But one, 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 one story he says, he says, this is Eusebius, he says, at this period, while Anicetus was head of the Roman church, Polycarp, who was still living, he's an old man, um, came to Rome and discussed with Anicetus some difficulty about the date of Easter. There was a dispute about when Easter should be celebrated between the East and the West. We'll talk about that in the fall. This we gather, we gather that he came to see Anicetus, we gather this, says Eusebius, from Irenaeus, who tells us another story about Polycarp, which must be included in the account of him that I am giving. Here it is. And then he writes, he quotes in his document from Irenaeus about Polycarp. He says, and before I, before I read this, I have to tell you, Polycarp, as indeed were Irenaeus, had to fight against early heresies. Indeed, indeed St. John and St. Peter and Paul had to fight against early heresies because there were suddenly Christianity came into the world and all these teachers sprung up and a lot of them were saying a lot of nonsense. And the apostles were the ones and their followers were the ones who were trying to say, look, uh, you've got these theories and these things, but it's not a theory. It's, it's, it's a message we got from, from God. We were there and we know what the true teaching is. And so they had to deal with lots of early heretics uh, in the church. And we're going to, in this, in this excerpt from Eusebius, he talk, in, in, excerpting Irenaeus, he talks about some famous heretics. It will deal with some of them in the fall, uh, God willing. He talks about Valentinus and Marcion, who are, who are uh, notorious early heretics, and also a man named Serenthus, who was an early heretic. Uh, but so here, here, here is Eusebius quoting uh, 
St. Irenaeus' stories about his teacher, Polycarp. Polycarp was not only instructed by apostles and conversant with many who had seen the Lord, but was appointed by apostles to serve in Asia as Bishop of Smyrna. I myself saw him in my early years, for he lived a long time and was very old indeed when he laid down his life by a glorious and most splendid martyr. At all times he taught the things which he learned from the apostles, which the church transmits, which alone are true. Remember, we're talking about the church transmitting the message and not tampering with the message. These facts are attest attested by all the churches of Asia and by the successors of Polycarp to this day. And he was a much more trustworthy and dependable witness to the truth than Valentinus and Marcion and all the other wrong-headed persons, these heretics. In the time of Anicetus, Bishop of Rome, he stayed for a while in Rome where he won over many from the camp of these heretics to the church of God, proclaiming that the one and only truth he had received from the apostles was the truth transmitted by the church. And there are people who heard him describe how John, John the, evang the Evangelist, the Lord's disciple, how John, when at Ephesus, went to take a bath, went into the bathhouse. But seeing Serenthus, the heretic, inside, St. John rushed out of the building without taking a bath, crying, let us get out of here for fear the place falls in. Now that Serenthus, the enemy of truth, is inside. So St. John, the apostle, runs into the bath and there's a heretic. He said, we better get out of here because God might cause his building to collapse for well, everybody. Uh, and that's how they, they, they felt about uh, the people who were perverting the message uh, in early times. Um, Polycarp himself on one occasion came face to face with Martian, another famous heretic. It's not Martian like from Mars, it's M-A-R-C-I-O-N, Martian. Um, and when Martian said, Polycarp, don't you, don't you recognize me? Polycarp replied, I do indeed. I recognize the firstborn of Satan. So Polycarp's not very diplomatic in reading. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So careful were the apostles and their disciples to avoid even exchanging words with any falsifier of the truth, in obedience to the Pauline injunction from St. Paul. Quote, if a man remains heretical after more than one warning, have no more to do with him, recognizing that a person of that type is a perverted sinner, self-condemned. Um, we have to be careful of applying this in our normal lives because a lot of people say things that are crazy and I don't recommend that you really, you know, <laughs> call them satanic. But, but at, the, at the time of the early church, uh, when they were, you're dealing with major heretics, this is exactly how Polycarp and, and Irenaeus was dealing with them. And this shows that in Rome itself, you have the Bishop of Rome, you have the Catholic Church, but there are all kinds of religions in Rome and all kinds of brands of, of Gnosticism and other perversions of, of Christian methods, message were going on. And the people who were preserving it were the people who were appointed to do so by Jesus Christ, the apostles and their successors who were transmitting a message and who were not inventing a philosophy or a theology. Uh, they, were, they were passing on what had been given to them. Um, Eusebius goes on. Eusebius says, There is a most forceful epistle written by Polycarp to the Philippians. This is the, the, the epistle you have. From which both the character of his faith and his preaching of the truth can be learnt by all who wish to do so and care about their own salvation. Such is Irenaeus' account, Eusebius says. Polycarp, in his letter to the Philippians referred to above, and still extant, in other words, Eusebius still has a copy of his letter, has supported his views with several quotations from the first epistle of Peter. And we'll see it in, in Polycarp's epistle that he does quote Peter. Um, let me continue on. Another place Eusebius writes about Irenaeus' recollections of Polycarp. And in this, in this passage, he refers to a letter written by Irenaeus to a man named Flor Florinus. And Florinus was preaching a heresy, so Irenaeus down here wrote a letter telling Florinus that he was wrong and that he was perverting the message. And so, so Eusebius quotes from Irenaeus' letter. He says, in the letter to Florinus, Irenaeus, Irenaeus, refers, Irenaeus refers once more to his association with Polycarp. He quotes Irenaeus as follows. Such notions, Florinus, to put it mildly, do not indicate a sound judgment. 
Such notions are out of harmony with the church and involve those who accept them in beliefs well nigh blasphemous. Such notions not even the heretics outside the church ever dared to propound. Such notions of the presbyters and his priests of an earlier generation, those taught by the apostles themselves, did not transmit to you. When I was a boy, he's talking about himself, Irenaeus, when I was a boy, I saw you, Florinus, in Lower Asia, in Polycarp's company, when you were cutting a fine figure at the imperial court and wanted to be in favor with him. I have a clearer, I have a clearer re recollection of events at that time than of recent happenings. What we learn in childhood develops along with the mind and becomes a part of it. So that I can describe the place where Blessed Car Polycarp sat and talked, his goings out and comings in, the character of his life, his personal appearance, his addresses to crowded congregations, I remember how he spoke of his discussions with John, St. John the Evangelist, and with the others who had seen the Lord, how he repeated their words from memory, and how the things that he had heard them say about the Lord, his miracles and his teaching, things that he had heard direct from the eyewitnesses of the word of life, were proclaimed by Polycarp in complete harmony with Scripture. To these things I listened eagerly at that time, by the mercy of God shown to me, not committing them to writing, but learning them by heart. By God's grace, I constantly and conscientiously ruminate on them, and I can bear witness before God that if any such suggestion, it's the heresy of Florinus, if any such suggestion had come to the ears of that blessed and apostolic presbyter, Polycarp, he would have cried out and stopped his ears, exclaiming characteristically, Dear God, for what times thou hast preserved me that I should endure this. Polycarp was apparently quite a character, but we'll hear of him. And he would have fled from the very place where he was sitting or standing when he heard such words. The letters he sent either to the neighboring churches to stiffen them or to individual Christians to advise and stimulate them furnish additional proofs of this. So there we have a lot of early historical testimony about Polycarp. And it really talks about how important he is to show that the true teaching is coming down through from Christ to the apostles and to the people appointed and their successors. Um, I'd like to turn now to the epistle itself. Um, J.P. Lightfoot, you have his translation, he's a great scholar uh, of Ignatius and Clement and Polycarp. And he notes, as many have noted, that the epistle of Polycarp is not, is not very original. He has a whole lot of things that he borrows from other people. Ignatius is full of fire and poetry, and, and Clement is, 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 has these long theological discourses and moral discourses, but Polycarp is basically repeating things that he read or heard or was taught. And so you won't find a lot of things in here that are really, really new, and Polycarp was not about doing things new. He was about preserving the message. And so, Polycarp's letter is much more of a character with him as a person who is a guarantee that the message is being faithfully transmitted. Um, his notion about heretics, though, and about the, the perversion of the teaching, if you turn to section, the, the second page, uh, third page, I guess, section uh, six on the top of page 474, uh, I'll read a little part of that. He says, he says about four lines down, he says, let us therefore so serve him, as Christ, with fear and all reverence, as he himself gave commandment to the apostles and he gave commandment, and the apostles who preached the gospel to us. So he's talking, he's talking about the apostles who were preaching the gospel to Polycarp. Uh, that includes St. John, and of course Peter and Paul had gone through major minor preaching as well, as well as some of the other apostles. And the prophets who proclaimed beforehand the coming of our Lord being zealous as touching what was good, what, what, which is good, abstaining from offenses and from the false brethren and from them, from them that bear the name of the Lord in hypocrisy, who lead foolish men astray. For everyone who shall not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is antichrist. And whoever shall not confess the testimony of the cross is of the devil, and whoever shall pervert the articles of the Lord to his own lusts and say that there is neither resurrection nor judgment, that man is the firstborn of Satan. So this is Polycarp's attitude to people perverting the message. And uh, if you hear Father McCarthy today in his homily, uh, 
uh, about uh, uh, Corpus Christi. Uh, we said, for everyone who shall not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, so about the incarnation and the Eucharist, that it really is, uh, that it, it's incarnation, that is God has become man, and that the flesh is what we are supposed to eat, eat his flesh and drink his blood. These are core parts of the faith. They're great mysteries. Very hard, to, very hard to understand. A lot of people reject them, uh, but Polycarp stands fast on this and says it's part of the message uh, that we got from the eyewitnesses who have known the Lord. Um, I'll skip over some of this. He, he references uh, Blessed Ignatius, uh, but he comes back to that later. Uh, and you can read this at your leisure. Uh, there are various quotations from from, from Scripture, from Saint Peter, Peter's epistles. But let's go right to the to the, towards the end of it on page 476. He has he has an exhortation in there to pray for all the saints. So here we have an early early uh, indication of the Catholic Catholic notion of the communion of the saints, and it, that that uh, prayers to saints are part of the early early church uh, and a normal thing, uh, uh, contrary to a lot of later. Uh, uh, Protestants and others who would say that no, that's something that was invented by the by the Catholic Church but it was centuries later. Here it is at a very early date by someone who's taught it by the apostles. In section 13, he says, and he's writing to the Philippians. He says, Ye wrote to me, both ye yourselves and Ignatius. He's talking about Ignatius and Antioch, asking that if anyone should go to Syria, that's Antioch, he might carry through the letter the letters from you. And this I will do if I get a fit opportunity, either I myself or he whom I shall send to be an ambassador on your behalf also. The letters of Ignatius, which were sent to us by him and others as may as we had by us, we send these letters of Ignatius unto you according as ye gave charge, the which are subjoined to this letter. And that's a very convoluted English, 19th century English way of saying I've sent you these letters, the seven epistles, and, and it's attached to my, my letter, and I'm circulating these things. So it's an early indication of, of the authenticity of the nation letters. And he says, For they, th these letters comprise faith and endurance of every kind of edification which pertaineth unto our Lord. Moreover, concerning Ignatius himself and those who were with him, if ye have any sure tidings, certify us. What he's saying is, if you don't have any news of what happened came of Ignatius, let us know. So that's the reason why we believe this letter was written about 110 before news of, of Ignatius's ultimate martyrdom in Rome had gotten back to the east. Um, that's the letter. That, that's enough I, that I want to talk about this epistle. I, I'll leave you to read it yourselves. The martyrdom uh, is the next document. This is dated around AD 156 uh, at the time of Polycarp's martyrdom. martyrdom. And it's a very interesting thing. It tells a very interesting story. And this is another one that I'll, I'll let you read yourself from the story. I want to just pick out a few things in it that I think are, are, are worth noting. Um, mm -hmm. It starts off with, he starts off, uh, the church of God which sojourneth in Smyrna, to the church of God which sojourneth in Philomelia, and to all the brotherhoods of the holy and universal church, sojourning in every place. Well, the words, the holy and universal church, uh, another way to say that is the Holy Catholic Church. Uh, in Greek, he's talking about the the the, the his Hagias Kai Catholikes Ecclesias, which is the Holy Catholic Church. Uh, another thing to notice about this is this is exactly the same way that Clement started his epistle back in '96. So he's he's copying. He's clear. He's he's got Clement's epistle because he, he. How do I start a letter? Well, let me do it the same way that the Bishop of Rome Clement did so many years before. Uh, and he, he ends it in almost exactly the same way. So, so it's another indication that these people were, were this letter was being circulated, uh, Clement's letter, many, many years after it was written. Um, and the people writing this are the Smyrnians. So they, we don't know exactly who they are, but they, they say, We write unto you, brethren, on account of what befell those that suffered martyrdom, and especially the blessed Polycarp. Um, Polycarp and 12 others were. Uh, martyred, were executed, uh, uh, and this is an account of that. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot because you can, you, it's, 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 I want you to read it for yourself to get the details of the story. But basically, Polycarp was arrested 
uh, and the police came to his house, and uh, uh, the, the policeman was named Herod, uh, 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 sort of an interesting coincidence, uh, and they named the people who came and, and took him away, and he went, he went with the, the arresting officers, um, and, he, and he asked for time to do a prayer, uh, and he did, he did that, but turn to page, section 8 on page 480. Um, because here, here he is, he says, the, the, the author of this uh, martyrdom says, but when at last Polycock brought his prayer to an end after remembering all who at any time had come in his way, small and great, high and low, and all the universal church throughout the world, there again is the Catholic church, the universal church, and it's throughout the world, he says, throughout the oikomene, it's a Greek word in Latin, ecumene, and we get that ecumenical councils, uh, uh, being ecumenical, uh, that was the way that in the ancient Greek world they talked about the Greek speaking world, was the oikomene. Uh, so all the universal church throughout the world, the hour of departure being come, they seated him on an ass and brought him into the city, it being a high Sabbath. And he was met by Herod, the captain of the police, and his father of Nicotines, who also removed him to their carriage and tried to prevail upon him seating themselves by his side and saying, why, what harm is there in saying Caesar is Lord and offering incense with more to this effect and saving thyself? But he at first gave them no answer. When however they persisted, he said, I'm not going to do what you counsel me. This makes it clear that Polycarp all he had to do was offer some incense and say Caesar is Lord and they would let him go. They didn't want to kill this 80 year old man and they thought it was crazy for him to be doing what he was doing. They couldn't understand it. Uh, but he refused to, to do what they said. In section 9, it becomes even more uh, acute here, and he says, when Polycarp was brought before him, the proconsul, the, the Roman uh, uh, the officer in charge of the, the, tri the trial, brought before him the proconsul, inquired whether he were the man, is he Polycarp? And on his, Polycarp's confessing that he was, the proconsul tried to persuade him to a denial, saying, have respect to thine age, and other things in accordance therewith, as it is there wont to say. Swear by the genius of Caesar, repeat and say, away with the atheist. The proconsul wanted Polycarp to say, away with the atheist. Well, who are the atheists? Uh, at this time period, the Roman authorities believed the atheists were the Christians. Yeah, the Christians, because they denied the gods. They denied Caesar, the divinity of Caesar, they denied Jupiter and Apollo and Minerva and all that. And so they were held to be atheists and dangerous atheists at that. So the proconsul says, swear by the genius of Caesar, repent and say, away with the atheists. And this is a, a little, in, in the midst of this grim story, there's a little bit of humor. He, he says, then Polycarp, with solemn countenance, looked upon the whole multitude of lawless heathen that were coming to the stadium and waved his hand to them. And groaning, looking up to heaven, he said, away with the atheists. <laughs> <laughs> this did not sit well with the proconsul, as you can imagine. <laughs> but when the magistrate pressed him hard and said, swear the oath and I will release thee, revile the Christ, Polycarp said, four score and six years have I been his servant, 86 years old. And he hath done me no wrong. How can I then blaspheme my king who saved me? So Polycarp uh, goes to his death professing uh, his Christian uh, religion and his, his reliance on Christ. Um, and he, and there's, the, 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 you, you should read this for yourselves because he, he has more back and forth with the proconsul. Then at the bottom of page 41, he says, Polycarp said, Thou threatenest that fire, they're going to burn him alive. Thou, thou threatenest that fire which burneth for a season, and after a little while is quenched. For thou art ignorant of the fire of the future judgment and eternal punishment, which is reserved for the ungodly. But why delayest thou? Come, do thou what thou will. So Polycarp is being steadfast to the end. As you recall, Ignatius' letter to Polycarp, he says, Polycarp, you're an anvil. You're a rock. You're very steadfast. And this is almost prophetic because of Ignatius were writing 110, and Polycarp was steadfast to the very end, many years later. Um, on page 42, section 12, uh, in the middle of that paragraph, it says, the proconsul was astounded 
and sent his own herald to proclaim three times in the midst of the stadium, Polycarp hath confessed himself to be a Christian. When this was proclaimed by the herald, the whole multitude, both of Gentiles and of Jews who dwelt in Smyrna, cried out with ungovernable wrath and with a loud shout, This is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the puller down of our gods, who teaches numbers not to sacrifice nor worship. So Polycarp is, is given a title by the, by the ungodly, the teacher of Asia. And in many ways he is the teacher of Asia because he's transmitting what he got from St. John and the other people who had seen the Lord. Uh, there's, a, there's a poignant section in paragraph 13. He says, and when the, the funeral pyre, the, 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 they're going to burn him at the stake, and, he, and he's taking off his outer garments. And he says, but when the pile was made ready, divesting himself of all his upper garments, garments and loosening his girdle, he endeavored also to take off his shoes, though not in the habit of doing this before, because all the faithful at all times lied eagerly, who should soonest touch his flesh. This is a reference to the fact that he was so revered that he, people would take their shoes off. Uh, they're, they're, his disciples would come and take their shoes off. He's an 86-year-old man. He might need help with that. Uh, but he was unused to taking his own shoes off. Uh, and here uh, is another statement about that here. Um, he then is, 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 is uh, tied to the stake. Uh, on, on 483, I, 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 there's a little, there's a, a prayer he says that, that, that uh, sort of prefigures the Gloria that we say. He says, I praise thee, I bless thee, I glorify thee. Through the eternal and heavenly I praise Jesus Christ. We see these in our liturgy. Early, early example of that. Um, in 16, he is, they light the fire in 15 and 16. He is, uh, uh, his body is not consumed, so they order an executioner to go up stabbing, and stabbing. And when he had done this, there came forth a dove and a quantity of blood so that it extinguished the fire. Um, they were worried, if you continue reading, they were worried about uh, Polycarp. The, the body being used for relics, so they, they burned it some more. But then, nonetheless, in paragraph 18, it says, it says, the centurion, therefore, seeing the opposition raised on the part of the Jews, set him in the midst and burned him after their custom. And so we afterwards, the office of the letter, we afterwards took up his bones, which are more valuable than precious stones, and finer than refined gold, and laid them in a suitable place where the Lord will permit us to gather ourselves together as we are able, in gladness and joy, to celebrate the birthday of his martyrdom for the commemoration of those that have already fought in the contest and for the training and preparation of those that shall do so hereafter. So here we have the, a reliquary. These, these are relics. And they're going to commemorate his birthday. They're going to have feast days after St. Polycarp. Uh, just like we have uh, in our in today in the Catholic liturgy, we have we the Catholic Church uh, uh, venerates relics and venerates feast days of martyrs and saints. And in the Protestant Reformation, the accusation was made all that stuff was all made up. That's that superstitious things that were made up long time afterwards. And the early church knew nothing of this. Uh, Christ and his apostles did not teach it. Well, here we have Polycarp of Smyrna and his followers clearly uh, talking about the cult of the saints and, and the veneration of relics. It's coming from people who have been taught by Christ and the apostles. Um, in paragraph 19, we have another, another set re reference to the Catholic Church. It says, it's in the middle of that paragraph, it says, Having by his endurance overcome the unrighteous ruler in the conflict, and so received the crown of immortality, he rejoices in company with the apostles and all righteous men, and glorifies the Almighty God and Father, and blesses, blesses our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of our souls, and helmsman of our body, and shepherd, the Episcopal shepherd, of the universal church, that's the Catholic church, which is throughout the world, throughout the oikomene, throughout the ecumenical world. Uh, and then it talks about there's a scribe who wrote this letter on behalf of the Smyrnians. And there's an addition to it, which is very interesting. At the top of page 48, 486, section 22, this is an addition to this martyrdom. And it, 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 it's an account of how this martyrdom came, this, this, this document came down to us. Um, there was a man named Gaius. He says, this account, Gaius, 
copied from the papers of Irenaeus, a disciple of Polycarp. Mm -hmm. And then under section three it says, and I, Socrates, wrote it down in Corinth from the copy of Gaius. Grace be with all men. And then next, the, next, the next scribe says, I, Pionius, again wrote it down from the aforementioned copy, having searched it out uh, for the blessed Polycarp, showed me in a revelation, as I will declare in the sequel, gathering it together when it was now well worn out with age. So this, this latest scribe is saying, I've got the one from Socrates, this paper, and it was worn, all was worn out with age, so I copied it again. And, and, and you can see it, it's, the, it's the, the paternity of this document. It, it would be written and copied, and the thing would get old and brittle and be about to fall apart, and somebody else would copy it. And that's how these ancient documents all come down to us. And it's one of the reasons that, that uh, you know, it's, it's, it's through Proverbs that we have part of anything. Because these, these ancient documents, they wear out, they get old, they get bored, they get stolen, uh, insects eat them up. Uh, but this was a, a revered document, and it was passed down from, apparently, the secretary of Irenaeus, a man named Gaius, who copied it from his papers. And doubtless, many other papers of Irenaeus were copied because they found their way into the library in Caesarea, where Eusebius was bitter in the early 300s, and he was able to write his ecclesiastical history and, read, and, and include excerpts from all these documents. And he has excerpts not only of Irenaeus, but early, other early documents we talked about earlier, how he talked about some of Rome uh, and various other things. So Eusebius is a wonderful source for the early documents of the church. And there are many, many additions to this. You can get it online. Uh, uh, Eusebius is E-U-S-E-B-I-U-S. -E and it's called the History of the Church or the Ecclesiastical History. There are various names it goes by. But it's a, it's a very interesting document for the early church. Um, have any questions about Polycarp? What is it? I did. Okay. The okay. back. Okay. <clears throat> on page 475 and 11 okay. down there where it says um, judgment of the Lord nay know we not that the saints shall judge the world as Paul teach it ah. what is that well the, the truth is I don't know but I can look <laughs> it up uh, I'll try to find that out um he, if it's in italics, that means that he is par par quoting or paraphrasing from some, some ancient uh, source. Now, I'll take a look to see exactly what that is. Uh, that is an interesting thing. The saints shall judge the world as Paul teaches. Um, that's a very interesting question. But I'll look into that. You know, I'll have to get back to you. And that when Christ <clears throat> tells the apostles of sin judgment. There you go. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Uh, years ago, I looked up, I was with a Jewish friend, and I said, you know what Catholic means? And he said, no. I said, it means universal. So we looked it up in this Oxford Dictionary, a huge, right. and that's the ab absolute sure. definition. Catholicos, so, it means according to the whole thing. Right. So, universal. I mean, when you point out universal, you right. line right up. Right. And the first use of it we saw occurs in the Epistle of Ignatius. Uh, First use of it, it comes down to us. It was obviously used before that, he wouldn't use the word in his letter. Mm -hmm. But the first document, earliest document to survive, using the word Catholic Church, comes from, comes from St. Ignatius. And what is it universal of that? Huh? Was yeah. it concerned the word? It, it's, a Greek, it's a Greek word, it's two Greek words, kataholos. And yes, it, it meant universal to Aristotle. Right. It means universal, in the Greek, it means universal. That's what it, what it means. Now, People who are uh, not fond of Catholic Church would say, well, it means universal. It doesn't mean that this is the Catholic Church. <laughs> I know. You know it's it, just, it just that means, it, it means, it means like us Baptists and, you know, whatever. Uh, it means, Everybody it means all, person, yeah. all the denominations is what it means. Uh, and we'll see later as we go on, uh, God willing, in the fall, we'll see that it very much means the Catholic Church in the sense of this church, not that church. And these people, clearly, when he talks about, the, say, John goes into the bathhouse and there's Serenthus in there, he says, we've got to get out of here, the roof's going to fall in. Serenthus had a church. Okay? Oh. But no way St. John or St. Pauli Park or St. Ignatius and are going to call Serenthus' church part of the universal church. He said, you need, to, you need to be in the universal, the Catholic church, the one church 
that preserves, that is, that was uh, established when Christ commissioned apostles. Uh, the one sent, in the Greek apostles, the one sent, sent forth by Christ, who, 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 who passed on the teaching to uh, their uh, successors, the bishops and priests of the church. That's the universal church. And, 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 and come back in the hall, you'll see all kinds of uh, uh, heresies everywhere. Uh, and, and we'll get to St. Cyprian. Uh, uh, I think St. Cyprian. I'll, I'll look it up in the fall, but there, there's somebody says, Where do we find the church? And he says, Well, when you go into a town, ask where the Catholics meet. That's the one you should go to. Because the churches, you know, there are quote, churches all over. Uh, uh, I says, hey, find where the Catholics meet. That's where you're going to go. Uh, it will be, and we'll see even more. Augustine. Augustine in his, in his city, he was an adult in his city. The, Christians, the Catholics were in a minority. And he, they were fighting over the, the city facilities. We'll get to that too. Uh, but the Catholic Church, it does mean universal, but it means the universal church, church founded by our Lord, the true church founded by our Lord. And we'll get to that as we go through this. Anything else? Why don't we close with a prayer? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Son of God, pray for us sinners now and now, and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Next weekend.